Brigger at Leeds, the very point where the city began its life as a market on a bridge. And it's here in the shops and arcades that pulsate from its beating heart that modern day Leeds thrives as a shopping mecca. There are more than 1,000 shops in central Leeds alone, the core of a city that Rough Guide has named the best shopping destination in the UK. But Leeds also played a major part in the production of textiles, cotton, wool and linen on an industrial scale whilst pioneering entrepreneurs revolutionised the production and the retailing of clothing. In many ways, Leeds truly was the tailor to the world. So come join me, Mark O'Brien, and local historian Jonathan Strait as we weave our way through the streets of Leeds. Streets of Leeds, we hit the road and explore the city's extraordinary history, stopping off at the places that are part of our story and meeting the people who are crafting the future here today. The thing is, Mark, everybody needs clothes. And at one time, Leeds really was the trailblazer for the move from a small cottage industry producing cloth and clothing to the mass production, which not only benefited Leeds economically, but which also helped to turn it into a major city. And it's really quite amazing how much happened right here in Leeds. And we'll take a look at some of the people and places involved. Many of these ideas drawn from the forthcoming Cradle of Innovation book. And to find out more about that, go to cradleofinnovation.org. It all began with wool. Now, since the beginning of human history, man has used the skin of the woolly sheep for clothing. Here was a very tough, durable fabric. It will protect from the wind and the rain. It would shield from heat and from cold. And for this reason, sheep were domesticated from very, very early on. We stop off first at Kirkstall Abbey, the centre of a whole community almost a thousand years ago. The monks that first came to Kirkstall were drawn from Fountains Abbey, the vast remnants of which still stand today near Ripon. They were encouraged by the wealthy nobleman Henry de Lacey, whose name you'll see today on the terraces that rise up from Kirkstall Road. He pledged land at Barnardswick to the monks for a daughter abbey, and Abbot Alexander and twelve Cistercian monks travelled there. They stayed for six years, but they were plagued by bandits and villagers disrupting their way of life, and they couldn't grow any crops. Legend has it that while journeying on business through Airedale, Abbot Alexander passed through a certain valley, then wooded and shadowy, its only residence the local hermits. The monks asked Henry for his help to buy the land. This land became the home of Kirkstall Abbey. Kirkstall Abbey was built by Cistercian monks in 1152 and one of the earliest activities they were involved with was keeping sheep. Now it may be that the land around the abbey wasn't too good to grow other crops on but the Cistercians were experts in farming the sheep and in collecting their wool. Now they would shear the sheep, wash and prepare the fleeces and then grade them into three types before packing them into sacks and selling them and this way they got the best price for them. The monks would also act as middlemen for other people who were farming sheep and this was very good for the local economy, boosting the finances of Leeds and in fact the north of England in general. Most of the wool went overseas to be turned into cloth. Now this involved two processes. The first was spinning where the fleece was pulled out and twisted into yarn and the second was weaving where one thread of yarn was placed over and under another to form a cloth. Later on, both of these processes became prominent local cottage industries. Of course, if you have cloth, you need somewhere to sell it. Leeds was growing fast and developing rapidly, and a cloth market soon began on Leeds Bridge. This current bridge was installed in 1873, but there was a bridge here from the early 1300s. That bridge was just 12 feet wide, and it was the site of an early cloth market right up to the 17th century, when the council decided that it would be moved further up the street. So Brigat always was a place of commerce, something that continues to this day. 
The market outgrew Brigat and there was now some competition. In 1710, Wakefield opened a covered cloth hall in order to try and entice traders away from Leeds. So the following year, a cloth hall for the trading of white cloth was opened on Kirkgate, and the remnants of it are still here to this day. Half a century later, another, much larger cloth hall was built in Holbeck, but after another 20 years, that too wasn't big enough. Nothing remains of that building now, other than the cupola, which now proudly sits on the top of the third white cloth hall. But this one ran into problems of a different kind. Part of it had to be demolished to accommodate a new viaduct running trains into central Leeds. A fourth hall was built at the expense of the railway company on the site that's now occupied by the Metropole Hotel. All that survives of the fourth cloth hall is another cupola, which was incorporated into the design of the hotel. It was not just wool that Leeds was famous for. Leeds was also a major centre for the conversion of flax into linen. Like wool, linen is a cloth that humans have used for many thousands of years. It is still used in clothing, but now many people take flax seed as a food supplement as it is full of omegas. One man was responsible for pioneering the spinning of flax on an industrial scale, and that was John Marshall. Marshall nearly bankrupted himself trying to perfect the process at Scotland Mills in Adel. Once he had cracked it, he built a mill here which started production in 1792. Within two years he had added another mill and then a further three mills between 1815 and 1831. These are the buildings that have survived and are now home to digital and creative businesses. Marshall planned ahead buying a large plot of land here in Holbeck and almost 50 years after he started, his most audacious construction was completed next door. Temple Works was built in the style of two Egyptian temples and was intended to allow Marshall to expand into cloth production. At the time it was built, it was said to be the biggest single room anywhere in the world. Flax spinning works best in a humid environment and so grass was sown on the roof of the building to keep it well insulated. Then, a small flock of sheep was used to keep the grass in good order. Sadly, a sheep fell through one of the magnificent glass skylights, killing a worker on the shop floor, and that was the end of the sheep. Child labour was another sad fact of factory life at the time, but it seems Marshall was something of an enlightened employer, allowing the children a day a week in school and providing dormitories under Croft. Benjamin Gott, very ambitious cloth merchant, and he built his first mill on the site which eventually became the Yorkshire Post building. And here he experimented with new machinery and production methods, and he was intent on turning this home-based woolen production industry into something that could be mechanised in order to allow much larger quantities of cloth to be produced. And the other thing that Gott did was bring together all the elements of wool production on a, on a single site, and he was hugely successful, eventually moving his mill out uh, a bit further away to Armley. Armley Mills is now a museum charting the development of key industries in the city, textiles and clothing included. Gott built the current building in 1805 following a fire which destroyed the earlier building on this site. Once up and running, this was the largest wool factory anywhere in the world. Powered initially by massive water wheels and then later by steam engines, this made Gott hugely successful. He lived in a mansion nearby. It's now in a park that bears his name to this day, Gott's Park. So the manufacture of cloth had expanded exponentially with the Industrial Revolution seeing the transformation of wool and linen production. Clothing too was about to undergo a similar process of disruption, both in terms of how it was produced and also how it was sold. Up to this time, much clothing was made in what would be termed a bespoke manner, specifically for the person wearing it. Clothing production was still a cottage industry with production in small sweatshops.
Coming up after the break, we find out about how all these transformations in technology came to disrupt the clothing market. Jonathan explores the history of one great Leeds-born institution. And I go shopping in town, discovering how Leeds' textiles heritage lives on to this day. So the manufacture of cloth had grown and grown. The Industrial Revolution transformed the way that wool and linen were produced. But that, what we might call market disruption, was about to hit clothing too, both how it was made and sold. John Barron was a Londoner, but in the 1840s, still in his early 20s, he was a man on the move, sailing north to Hull and boarding the brand new railway to Leeds to find a job in this burgeoning industrial town. He set up shop on Brigate, but his business was limited. By 1856, he had over 20 of the brand new sewing machines from America, but his hand cutters could only cut one garment at a time. Two years later, he went to a furniture exhibition and saw a new piece of machinery, a band knife used for cutting layers of wood veneer that was invented by Thomas Beecroft. Barron wondered if this idea could work with cloth. It did, and so began the era of ready-made clothing. He built his factory on Park Place and built this immense warehouse on Park Square. It's a gorgeous design which still stands to this day. It's called St Paul's House nowadays. It's a taste of Moorish Spain in modern Leeds. It was built with good sanitation and lighting, as well as a dining room for the workers. It was a departure from the sweatshops for which 19th century Leeds was notorious. Fetid, filthy rooms in which sometimes dozens of people, men, women, boys and girls, were all working as many as 17 hours a day for a paltry wage. Barron, who later became a liberal mayor of Leeds, had a reputation for good conditions and fair pay. Indeed, it was Barron who led Leeds Council to buy over 770 acres of the Roundhay estate to create a new park a haven for all people from the grimy industrial dark heart of Leeds. It was jeered at the time as a white elephant, but today thousands of people visit every year, one of the largest urban parks in Europe. Another retail revolution was started by a Jewish immigrant who spoke hardly any English when he arrived here from Lithuania. His name was Meshi Osinski, although he was known as Montague Burton. Now, what Burton did was offer what he called a five pound suit for 55 shillings, which was just over half of the normal price. And this was incredibly successful. His business grew from just five stores in 1913 to 400 just 16 years later when the company floated on the stock market. Burton's factory was in Leeds because he recognised that Leeds was the centre of Britain's textile industry and this would give him access to the skills he needed to grow his business. 10,000 people worked at his factory, producing more than 30,000 suits each week, making it the biggest clothing factory in the world. Burton's may have even given rise to the phrase, the full Monty, referring to a full three-piece suit with a spare pair of trousers. Between them, Barron and Burton transformed the manufacture and retailing of clothing. Burton was an immigrant and Barron built his business by employing immigrants in his factories. Now, one such immigrant was a Mr. Marx, who, finding himself lost, asked for directions to Barron's works. Marx actually worked there for a, for a while. Now, the man he asked was called Isaac Dewhurst and he was a wholesaler of textiles and he took a shine to, to Marx, helped him to learn English and eventually lent him five pounds to set up his first penny bazaar, to set up his stall in business and also introduced him to Thomas Spencer. Now Spencer was a cashier working for Dewhurst and so Marx and Spencer were born, opening their first market stalls from 1894 and then their first shop in Leeds in 1904. 
and the rest is history. It's incredible to think of the connections between all those people, these innovators. They knew each other. Well, they did, and, and in this case, completely by accident, but it worked out for the, for the best for of all course. of them. The University of Leeds now plays host to a dedicated archive for Marks and Spencer. Jonathan went along to open its vaults. Marks and Spencer has been on pretty much every high street in the country for as long as anyone can remember. These days there are more than 1,400 stores around the world and they don't just sell clothes, they sell housewares, beauty products and food too. I'm at the University of Leeds and this is the Marks and Spencer Archive. And I'm with Nicola Herbert, who's an archivist here. Nicola, what is the Marks and Spencer's archive? So the M&S Company archive is really the home of Marks and Spencer heritage going all the way back to 1884. We look after a huge collection that contains all sorts of records from over the years, as well as examples of the products that we've sold. And how many different items are there in the collection? So there's around 71,000 items in the collection, um, so it's a really great resource and a really diverse collection as well. And some of these things must be quite old and quite fragile. How do you make sure that they, that they stay in pristine condition? Absolutely, there's lots of things that were never intended to last for very long and certainly not for 130 odd years. So we have to work quite hard to make sure that they're not going to deteriorate. So some of the key ways we do that are by using storage that's temperature and humidity controlled, as well as using lots of acid-free materials to help package them and protect them into the longer term. Now you must have some crazy things here. What, what's the most unusual thing you've got in the archive? There's all sorts. I don't think I could ever pick just one unusual object. Um, there's lots of quirky examples of underwear from over the years, reflecting all sorts of trends in women's underwear. Um, all sorts of examples of the food packaging from over the years, as well as lots of examples of things like staff training records in stores going all the way back to the sort of very early days as well. It's fascinating. How important do you think it is that the archive is based in Leeds? It's great that M&S still has this connection to Leeds. When the archive moved to Leeds in 2012, it was really fantastic. Um, and it's great to have a link as well with the University of Leeds, um, given that we've got a partnership with them. So to be on campus is perfect. Nicola, thank you very much. No problem, thank you. More than a century since M&S grew from a penny bazaar in Kirkgate Market, independent shops and designers still call Leeds their home. Over three decades ago, Martin Schneider founded Accent Clothing, an outlet at the heart of the Queen's Arcade that still draws fashion designers from across the globe. Accent started in 1984. Uh, it's a bit of a long story how we, how we got into it. Um, there was a little shop in, this, in the Queen's Arcade years ago, late 70s, early 80s, that I used to frequent called Primo. I used to work abroad and every time I came back from my job abroad, I had some money, not a lot of money, but I'd, I'd go and buy clothes. And the guy in there, uh, there was a manager in there who, who said, I'm opening my, other, uh, my own shop, do you want to be my partner? Which, at the time, I'd been working abroad for a number of years and, and, and we said yes. I said, yeah, we'll have a go at it. And then when it came down to it, the guy didn't actually have any money. So one of my close friends said, oh, I'll do it with you. Neither of us had a clue absolute no idea what we were getting into or what we were doing went to the I remember the first brand we bought was uh, Liberto jeans went to the uh, picked out some jeans that we liked went to sit down to write the order and and, and that was it we just bought some stock um, and put it in the shop began trading the rest is history really one of its popular lines is Ross Barr a knitwear designer from right here in West Yorkshire. Um, Ross Bar is men's knitwear brand. Um, that's all about rejuvenating British manufacturing and the wool and textiles industry, both across the UK and here in Yorkshire. Over the last kind of 50, 60 years, we've seen the British textile industry and the Yorkshire textile industry massively decline. I mean, you can see from Bradford to Leeds to Wakefield and Huddersfield, all the mills have gone practically and all the old beautiful mill buildings have either been knocked down or turned to apartments. I've lost a lot of that heritage and employment opportunity as well. When I first started out, I worked in Wakefield and the amount of times I heard from young people 
who were on benefits etc saying that there's no opportunity for them in the local area anymore that had a massive effect on me and so my goal is to try and bring that back and bring opportunity back to Yorkshire region. I mean I still think I'm the boy from Wakefield you know still peddling his knitwear and it's been amazing but it's amazing to have support of local shops like Accent here and Martin etc who get behind brands and get us in front of the public uh, because without them you know none of us would be able to sell. And we're back here on Brigitte, the very spot where Leeds' story as a textiles hub and a shopper's paradise began. And it's here that the modern day retailers ply their trade, where the trendsetters of the 21st century walk in the footsteps of those pioneering industrial innovators of Leeds and the world. Yes indeed, and it's all part of the rich fabric of the streets of Leeds. Next time on Streets of Leeds, we tread the boards at the music halls and theatres, the cinemas and film sets as we uncover Leeds' dizzying cultural history.